Hello. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi to everybody in the chat. So great to see you. Special hello to our members who have joined the channel. Great to see you here as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining and coming along today because I'm Natalie, and this is Scientology Life After a Cult. You will catch me in the mornings doing my recap about Scientology news, what has the internet buzzing about it, and I share about my 35 years in Scientology and how I left with three generations of my family, but my ultimate favorite thing is to do live streams, do interviews, chat with other people in the community and around and get their view on things, find out more about their story and what makes them tick and where they're coming from. And not that long ago, I think it was just last week, I had uh, Dylan Gill, who many of you know here on the channel, Blow Drill, and we are going to pick up where we left off. Last time he was here, we really got into the conversation around the secret vaults that Scientology has, where they are stashing away L. Ron Hubbard's, all of his, all of his data, all of his technology. And that was fascinating. I'm still thinking about that, a lot of the things we talked about. And today we might touch on that, but we're going to get a lot more into exposing some of Scientology secrets as they relate to the C organization. We were both in the C organization, which is like Scientology's paramilitary branch. That's where you sign the billion year contract and you have a whole nother set of rules different from the average Scientologist. And Dylan and I had different experiences because we were at different levels in the organization. And uh, I think it'll be neat to talk about what that was like and how those experiences were similar or how they varied. So if you have questions, go ahead and share them. But if you could put question in front of your question, that would help me be able to keep an eye on those so we can answer as many as we can. I appreciate it. Thank you so much to Dip Me in Glitter, who's here being a mod. Appreciate your help. Always great to see you. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up here to the main stage. Dylan Gill, who you all also know as Blow Drill. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. You were, I was muted. Yeah, you were muted. <laughs> How you, doing? you were muted, but then I got to do my Dylan more, longer, which was going to lead to a hip hip hooray. <laughs> hey, how's it going, everybody? So I good to have of... you back again. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you having me for sure. There were Looking so many chat. things. <laughs> yes. There were so many things that I thought about after we last spoke because we really got into the whole what goes around these whole those bases where Elwan Harbert has a house at each place and he he had these vaults and the material and everything that went into that. It was absolutely fascinating, which then kind of we touched on a bit about the whole Sea Org experience. Right. And you and I figured out that we definitely crossed paths because when I was in the estates organization at the blue buildings, it was called the Pacific base crew. You were there on a mission, right? right. And because our companion, our commanding officer for our organization was sent to the rehabilitation project force and Dylan was on that mission. And we, so we, but we were both, we were probably, cause we're, we're about the same age, I think. Right. I'm yeah, 53. I think, I think, yep. Same. Yep. Yeah. So we were both probably about 16, 17 at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you were there um, on mission. It was, um, it kind of reminds me of like when you watch, you know, Star Wars and that like saga where the emperor was trying to convert people to the dark side. <laughs> it was, you know, like going on a sit handling mission in the, in the sea org. Um, was huge because we i had only had them kind of done to me so um ha going and doing like a, a mission where you handle a situation that has occurred like where the stats have completely crashed or you know there's a ton of out ethics or those kind of things so yeah it's a, it's a it was a crazy crazy experience do you by chance remember i mean this was a million years ago do you remember what the mission was for? I'm just curious. Um, I know I don't. Yeah, it was. So at the time, the HGB was had just been purchased and was being renovated. Right. Yeah. And that's the building so where. That's the Hollywood where, Guarantee building. That's where all yeah. the stuff is now. Yeah. Senior HCO, um, 
their ASI, no, ASI doesn't have offices. Um, OSA has offices there. Um, all the able wise, um, applied scholastics, Narcanon, all that used to be downtown. And then they moved it up to the Hollywood guarantee building once that was all completely renovated. So, yeah. Yeah. So when you were there on mission though, what do you remember what you guys were there to do, what the situation was? Cause like you said, you get, and missions go in usually in two, right? And right. you get a briefing, you got to do a whole thing to get ready to go. And you learn what the situation is and what the handling is that you're there to implement. Right. So, so. Let, I'll give you a, a more of a behind the scenes view of it. Um, yeah. A lot of people who yeah. follow yeah. X Scientology <laughs> um, know of a guy named Don Jason. Oh, um, yeah. Wasn't Don Jason in security? Yeah, he First. no, he, he was on the ship. Um, and prior to that, he was... Um, he was at the the what was left of the old continental liaison office um but for flag so the the flag pretty much the um flag land bureau um okay and he was in charge he was manned on a mission with me basically and sure. i was a messenger at the time and, and he was in like senior hco senior flb so he was like management but parallel level to me so we got and they were like worried about who would be a mission in charge or who would be a second because a, somebody couldn't be in charge over a messenger or whatever it was like this weird thing but um we were briefed and so don jason and i um were briefed on this sit handling mission and basically it was like that pack crew was kind of off the rails like there was a bunch of stuff going on their stats had crashed their ceo i think it had and i don't want to i don't know if we had said his name so i don't really want to say anything about him personally because i know him okay. he's a nice he's a very nice man um but i think he had had maybe some questionable 2d stuff or there had been something like that um, or financial irregularities one of, it's usually one of those like when you do an eval an evaluation in scientology in an organization it's usually like um out tech financial irregularities or like 2d irregularities basically um yeah, so he was and 2d so for those anyways, who don't know, that has to do with yeah. uh sex and relationships right right yeah the physical act or the one person that you are with as an intimate partner um mm -hmm. so we got briefed and we got fired on this mission in the middle of the night and we we're going to catch like um the last flight out of tampa to LAX and then we'd get picked up and you know we'd muster up well this was my second flight ever right so my first flight was from San Francisco to Tampa to join the Sea Org <laughs> uh -huh. and my second flight was from Tampa to Los Angeles in full class A uniforms um to go do a sit handling mission so it was so I was a little nervous the whole oh, yeah. Sea lanyard uniform, yeah black buttons Everything. and the lanyard and if you have any bars you're wearing those so you had to wear it right. on the plane i bet today they don't even let people do that because it draws attention oh my there. gosh no I, I doubt they would um it was very it was like one of the first times that i was actually embarrassed like mm, i felt very like um insecure you know about just what i would like what i was representing um because people it was very confusing at the time and when you were in the nucleus it felt very normal like we wore the navy whites and you know it felt very comfortable because everybody was wearing the same thing but when we went out yeah. and went on this mission for it was just a short and it was in the middle of the night but it felt weird enough at the airport so we're at the tampa airport and, and you're 16 17 years old I'm like 16, 17. Don Jason's probably like 28, I want to say 30, maybe. Um, super amazing human being, but he's a like total joker integrator. So we're at the airport and they're like, um, it's gonna be like 45 minutes or an hour. So we're standing there, we're we're waiting, and Don says, you know, hey, uh, I got a bad feeling about this flight. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And he's like, no seriously he's like I, I think maybe we should take the next flight i was like you know whatever yeah shut up don you're, you're whatever he's like no man yeah. i'm serious I, he's like i gotta 
I had a really bad feeling about this. And so we went, this went on for like 20, 30 minutes. And I was like, finally, I got this like feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, like you're right. Like we should take the next flight, you know? And I'm like, yeah. and then he's like, ah, I'm just screwing with you. <laughs> and I was just like, ah, <laughs> it was, so there was like some levity in the sea. So there was like that internalness of it. Right. Mm -hmm. of course when we got there we had to be super you know tone 40 and command attention and yeah. all that kind of stuff but yeah so it was just you know rpf the co um put the establish the new co on post and run the org in the meantime and fix all the areas so oh just like some minor thing how long were you there um we were there for i think about two and a half weeks maybe a little bit longer yeah, that's not too long. And then you went back yeah. to the flag land base. Yes, that's right. So and at what post. point, back to your post, there <laughs> was <post> actually, <laughs> let's say that again. No, it was, I don't know if we were talking about it, but I, I in the Sea Org, you weren't you. You didn't look at yourself as Dylan. Yeah. You looked yeah. at yourself as your post title. Yes. wherever you were like that you yes. were the cope officer or you were so it's funny like when we talk about all this stuff now like when i think about it i think of myself as a cope like as that job title as that instant hat or that fully hatted or missionaire or like i didn't mm -hmm. you you don't identify as yourself doing a job you identify as you're the vessel for that job so it's just kind very of true that's a really good yeah. point that's a great point dylan and you're totally right and that's often what people were called you know right. you would be yeah. dressed as hey cope off get right. out of here oh, exactly what? <laughs> yeah job title. So not even your rank but your actual job title I'm no rank was more it was so irrelevant rank was mainly to yeah. see so you could get paid more <laughs> if you if you were higher rank you got more you got pay. paid more for higher rank yeah in the oh yeah for sure. What? <laughs> yeah. So you were always encouraged to like apply for it. And oh, yeah. Try to get up. It. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you get busted no. as much as like that was part of B of I's and, or board of uh, inquiries and stuff would be like, yeah. you know, you are busted down to petty officer second class and you're like, boom. That's like $8. <laughs> That's $8. Exactly. <laughs> right. a great question and kind of leads to where my brain was going. Mar Maria Martins, I can't find a common trait on those that rose in the Scientology organization. Is it random? How do you get chosen? Scientology has mysterious ways. Now, Dylan, I think I've told you, I know I've talked about it on the channel. When I joined the C organization, I joined the lowest level org possible. It did not get any lower. And right. it was twofold for me. One, I was comfortable there because before joining the C organization, I was in Los Angeles training to, to have a job back in Hawaii. And so yeah. I was on work study and I was already working with those guys. And so that just felt more natural to me. And then I thought, well, if I can keep it low level, I can keep myself out of trouble. Hmm. And after... I don't know how long it was. I got then traded to the continental liaison office right. where then I was in treasury and I was like, okay, I do not want to go any higher here. This is still, I can make this work. <laughs> it's right, crazy, right. But not, you know, super crazy. And then I got approved to be some, I think it was the L. Ron Hutt, well, L. Uh, it was for the pack base. It was the, oh, that L. Uh, the L. Ron Hubbard communicator or the LRH okay. com, right, like right. for the base and a bunch of people, they were trying to get approved. No one got approved. I got approved. I have no idea how I just looked good on paper because we had to do all these tests and things in the Sea Org when you were up for a certain position. And not long after that, I got pregnant and then I got sent, you know, sent away with my daughter right. and my husband at the time. So in my mind, when I think about that question, I think it has a lot to do with the, you know, what the need is and where the need is and who can fit that. Not based on, I got put in treasury. I'd never balanced a checkbook, <laughs> right? but you, you learn um, how to do it. But you went from becoming a Sea Org member to much, much higher. 
So I think you're better equipped to answer that question on how that worked out, how each step led to the next one. Um, well, Who did yeah, you you're in that job, right? Um, <laughs> no, I, I was completely kind of clueless to the whole process, um, until I was actually doing the process. So it was sort of similar. Um, I, the way I was, when I was first recruited, um, I think I was around 11, 12, um, I had signed a steward contract. Um, I was at the online's at the missions. Like, so my, um, my grandfather had been on lines earlier and read the book and was sort of affiliated and then fell off. And then my dad kind of did it and then was sort of a hippie for a while and then went back to it with my uncle. And so that's when I kind of, I think when he became a single parent, but like when I was four or five, that like kind of like a picture I sent you. Um, yeah, that's that was when a I cute got, picture. um, sort of re indoctrinated in it and my life became very compartmentalized and mm. you know and it was something that like saved my father's life i think an incident happened where there was you know he basically had to make a choice and um so he chose Do you know what happened faith. or what the choice was um I was, I think I was like three, I, so I don't really like, I have some vague, I could, <laughs> I could make up a lot of stuff and give you yeah. a little bit of what it, it's really, so yeah. I, I really don't, um, but I know that after, cause I know one of the lines that gets used on me even to this day is that, you know, my father could, could have, you know, this, this saved his life. Like this, huh. you know, Scientology saved him. Like he's, so it was kind of, that's always that big turning point, you know, and I remember being young where my dad and uncle went to join the Sea Org and they, they had taken LSD, so they weren't qualified. And then oh. after that, like the push was kind of like, well, you can. And so I signed my first Sea Org contract. And at that point, I was pretty excited. And then as I got older, I was doing, um, you know, student hat. I was doing a lot of courses, the Hubbard Apprentice Scientologist, you know, which included your upper indoctrination TRs. Um, like TR six through nine. Um, and then um, I was starting to skip a little bit, you know, class time. And um, I got more in trouble. Like my dad wanted to send me um, to directly to the RPF at 14. Oh, he wanted... that's right. Yeah. I remember that your dad wanted and, you to do the RPF right in the Sea Org, which is so stupid. Well, and you know, not having any reality of what it was, I don't think he, I just thought he was like, well, you're ethics bait and you need to, you know, like get your ethics in. And and the recruiter at the time was like, well, we'll do a repair of past ethics conditions and you're all good. You know, yeah, so it's like, oh, okay, perfect. No, it's, an action, it's an action you can take in Scientology to fix some, some sin, some something you did in the past and you get it all worked right. out in the present. Yeah. You write up all the conditions and you go through the conditions and. Yeah, and then you're totally okay. So then you sign a CO contract and off you go. You know, so that's uh, so when I started, it was more um, I was recruited for flag crew. So I was recruited for the equivalent of what you joined, pack crew. Mm -hmm. And during my EPF, um, this was right when like the free wins had been purchased. So there was a lot of people. They tried to recruit a ton of people that had worked for the free wins. And yeah. so they had gotten a handful of them and they were trying to do the EPF, the estates project force. Um, so I, when See I did my team. basically right. So mm -hmm. this, it's, it, this is when, you know, it's like cattle is all the, the personnel offices, the HCOs basically trade people like cards, Yeah, you know, exactly. and they have like, all your, them. well, like you said, so they, they make them do, uh, the OCA which is the Oxford capacity analysis. They make them do yeah, an IQ. Personality test. Most people know right. it that way through the protest. Right, yeah. right. The personality test. Um, they make them do an aptitude test, an IQ test, and then a life history test. And then that's kept in your personnel files. And then any other pertinent information based on those or anything like that. So that's how personnel you're dealt with, basically. And if you have uh, pre-clear files and Usually when you join the Sea Org, you don't have a big ethics file, but it's generated, trust me. <laughs> yeah, it um, is. Can you, I wanted to kind of make a point though of saying these tests that we always had to do, 
like the personality test, which is something even outside of staff or the C or you do because you do it at the beginning of an auditing thing and then you do it like when you finish. That's not uncommon. Right. The aptitude and the IQ test that we had to do, what struck right. me as odd is it was always the same test. The more yeah, they like gave it to us, the more we learned how to do it. <laughs> there, there was, I think actually there was, I want to say six different versions and there was of the aptitude there was like four because in hco we used to just sit there yeah i felt like i always took this one it's no they're super close they are super close but we used to practice them in hco we just sit there all day and practice like make print copies and practice them and then put our best score in our personnel file yeah see that's how you got to where you were and then let's let's talk a little bit about the life history so the life history is pages long of incredibly intimate questions. And when I did my first one, I think I was 15 mm. and it blew me away. And you were probably, you might've been younger or close in age when you went into the Sea Org because to qualify for certain jobs in the Sea Organization, and this is the thing I want to clarify, in the outside world, right? It might be like, okay, let's look at your schooling. Let's meet you. Let's see if we think you're going to be a good fit for the team. In the sea organization and in Scientology, many positions don't just depend upon, it's really not so much about what you can do specifically, it's more about your ethics record. You do not qualify to do certain jobs in Scientology or be at certain levels in Scientology as a staff member or Sea Org member if you did certain things. For example, I'll give you an example. If you want to work, if you're going to work in the Hubbard Communications Office, which is like Scientology HR, you could never have attempted suicide among a whole bunch right. of other things. You could not have been like abusing substances for some huge length of time or being anything with, with the, the military you know, or anything with yeah. uh, psychiatry or reporters. Yep. Um, or call anything. out. Yeah. If you got an uncle who's a reporter, you're only going to go so far. Or out right. 2D as they call it. So like if you, you know, are being a hoe, they that you're not right. qualified for that. And also so, drug reverts is somebody oh who like that's another if you can't be in any HCO or some executive positions is is another. And drug revert is like if you were informed and then did any kind of drug, you're a drug revert. It, yeah. I mean it makes no sense, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, wait a sec. Once you know better, if you do it, you're a drug reaver. And it's like, oh, okay. Exactly. Doesn't matter if you've never done it before. Like most people who be in the Sea Org, because exactly. most most people, especially the kids in the Sea Org, grew up in Scientology. So you pretty much were groomed to do this, that you would one day be in the Sea Org, at least for a lot of, not all Scientology parents, but a lot of them, and especially the hardcore ones. So, right. so you do your life history, you do all that, and then that's how they decide where you're going to go. But those test scores can change, so you qualify to be promoted and do something else. So, how did it how did it work then for you to go from you were being I inter I interrupted you, but I wanted to make sure people understood that life history plays a key role in where you're going to be put. Do you remember some of the questions? I mean, it's every I I remember one that I I got questioned on. Like, I remember they, they were like, okay, you're done. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, huh? Like it usually yeah. takes a lot longer. And I'm like, oh, I guess I don't have much of a life history yet. Um, yeah. And that was the thing. Most of us, like we didn't like what history. And that's why the questions were so shocking. I was trying to right. see if I could quickly find a copy, but I do recall that, you know, a lot of it, cause they're just obsessed with sex, <laughs> even though right. have you ever, um, have you ever, yeah. Right. I, I and, have you ever things I didn't even know what they were. Right. And you're just like, uh, can, is there an NA one? I can just go like never done anything. And then yeah. <laughs> like totally inexperienced. I, psychology. I lived a sheltered life. Yeah. Right. So you do all it. of that. You go into the Sea Org and you're saying that you're on the EPF with people, the Estage Project Force, which is Sea Org member boot camp. You're on there with right. all these people from the free winds from the ship. Right, Chip and South Africa. There was a bunch of people from South Africa, um, like David Berman, Paul Lipsitz, um, a lot. I think Paul Lipsitz is still at the base. Um, and a bunch of people from Italy. Um, that's where Scientology had been focusing at the time because Germany was kind of off limits at that point. 
Um, yeah, that's true. Or getting there really close at that time. Um, so we were all on the EPF together and a, a few of the people were extremely second gen, third gen, um, but they had gone to mandatory military in South Africa. And so they become, they became very unqualified for uh -huh. any kind of like, so there was some trades that were worked out and, um, I was traded to the Commodore's messenger organization in Clearwater. And so then when I finished my EPF, um, I did my CMO EPF and then yeah, they have started, their own. yeah, then you do like a little, another little EPF and then, um, you start expediting, which is basically, you're just, a uh, a gopher for whoever you're assigned to. And then do you remember you, who you were a gopher for or what your role was or duty? Yeah. I was actually put in the missionary unit, um, almost immediately. Okay. And, um, while I was waiting to be posted and you, you have, so when you finish your CMO EPF, you have a process where they, they take all your stuff, all your personnel, all your ethics, PC files, everything that happened on the EPF. Um, and they send it up lines for you to be approved as a messenger. And the only yeah. people that could approve you as a messenger at the time were watch messengers, people that had been on watch with LRH or been around LRH. Um, so there was a process for that to happen yeah. um and in the meantime you just were basically doing missions and you were basically a messenger in training sure and so called. while you were doing that training though you were allowed to do missions and is that the point where you went mm -hmm. to la to the pack base to do the mission where our paths would have would have crossed no that was um it was about a, a, a year and a half into it when i was already posted in the actual org um, so we did the, uh, the missionary unit in Florida was more for just missions into the flag service org and into flag crew. Sure, and so we sure. did a bunch of, you know, evals and obs missions and observation missions and, um, into those orgs constantly. There's a, uh, there was just a relevant question here. Carrie's asking how old were you when you were traded? Did it take you across state lines or country borders it it does for many it does for many actually you could be out of the country you could be sent anywhere uh for you you were traded you still you were in florida at that point but you were traded later and sent across the country so i was um recruited in san francisco um and my father sent me from san francisco to florida um, and Why then I was, you pack? I'm just curious because you're right there because there was a mission. So it was, there was a big, <laughs> a big kerfuffle. Um, cause the mission that <laughs> when I was younger, I'd signed a sealed contract and I can't remember who I'd signed it with, but it was somebody in pack. Um, and when I, when I was older, when I was 14, there was a mission that came around and they were recruiting for flag. And so when they recruited me, I'd signed a new contract and then they shipped me. They're like, well, no, you're going to flag. You're not going to LA. You're going to flag because you were recruited by a flag mission and they took seniority. So <laughs> and that was, I don't know. So I had no, at the time we had no clue. So it was like this weird, like, even then it was a grab. So yeah, basically recruited in California, flown to Florida. And then, yeah, there was. In when I was in at the um Oregon, Florida, there was well, my the girl that I ended up marrying, she was from England and originally from Australia, and her parents and were she and she still are. She um, she oh, was yeah. actually went to she was brought to England first and she went to Greenfields with Claire Headley, um, wow. when they were like six or seven years old. Um, and all their parents had worked together. Um, Bob and Ellie Bolger are still at flag right now. They're like really old and pretty much sequestered in hospice at the uh, Hacienda Gardens. Um, wow. And who are it, they? Um, they're uh, Bronwyn's parents. That, were, that was my wife in the Sea Org. Ah, oh, gotcha. Um, okay. So, and they're from Australia. But yeah, yeah. they. How, um, how, old was your, how old was your wife? Um, she, she, she was our age. Yeah. Same age. So same, she, when she got recruited age, yeah. into this year, was she around 16 as well? 
No, I believe she was like six. She was like six or seven in Saint Hill and Greenfields, and like she went. She grew up in Scientology schools. Well, her parents were on the ship with LRH. Wow, that's so. crazy. Do you neuropsych? This is a great question. Do you do you feel like you were exploited and trafficked? I think specifically like at that age, probably because the idea of and we never thought about it. I mean, I don't remember thinking like, oh, I'm being traded like a whatever. It was just that's just how it worked. Right. It's just, um, <laughs> it's just how it was. You know, I was thinking about this earlier, and I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I I think that where we were we believed in it and we thought at the time you know if you were even grown up or or you were nurtured into it or corrosively persuaded you know that's a gradual corrosion of your basic morals and ethics and and then those are are replaced with a whole new system which can yes. mimic that that basic human system um, which makes it more acceptable. And then when you see your family doing it and saying, oh my God, it's like having a great conversation with somebody and you, you learn something about yourself that you've never learned before. Amazing. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You know? And so you, you just normalize it. And um, so I don't know that, I mean, if anything, it's, it's like everybody's sort of said, you're a prisoner of belief. Um, and you believe it until you don't. And then when you don't, you know, we have varying ways of healing and stages once you even accept what healing is, you know, yeah. and then when you accept what healing is, it's, you know, your identity shattered. <laughs> and then yeah. you have to like either but later at way right. after it happened. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's when, you know, like when people run away, even then they're still in that prison of belief. You know, with all these basics, like, well, they're the most ethical group on the planet, of course. I mean, it, there was just a one or two bad apples, right? Yeah, and then you yeah, start, once better. you peel that, <laughs> right? So, yeah, I think yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I don't know that I feel trafficked. Um, I, I think um, I felt like it was, I was a willing participant, even though I had no right to consent. Um, yeah. Totally. Okay. I get that. I always say, we say now that my sister was trafficked into the sewer at 14, but right. I often felt like I trafficked myself, but I was 16, you know, 16, 17. And in part went, cause I just had nowhere else to go. My mom was there in LA. My sister was there. You know, I had mm -hmm. grandpa dad back home in Hawaii. Things weren't exactly working out there for me, <laughs> but this right. idea right. of going you know, when you're there and you get told, okay, now you're going to go, here's where you're going to go. There's no say, because part of the code, what was it? Part of a code of a searing member is you accept any duty. There's an exact oh. wording to it that I don't recall anymore, but you accept, basically yeah. you'll do any job you're given. Right. And without right. SAS, I mean, there's no SAS. You're expected to perform, right. There's no H E N R. There's no, you know, you don't have, you've done, you're expected to basically, you've done this job before in a past life. And you're expected to get an instant hat and you're expected to do basically the the duties of the job you know and yeah. in scientology all the jobs are written and made up by lrh like all yeah, the org board stuffs true. are all written and done you know completely by lrh so that's completely yeah, true in traffic, act punk, yeah. you make a good point by definition y'all were trafficked and Kerry pointed out that labor trafficking defined in federal law as recruitment, transport, obtaining a person for labor through force, fraud, or coercion for purpose of involuntary servitude, debt bondage. <laughs> so right. that's well, why and when, yeah, totally did you, who did, who signed for you when you joined? Like, did you had to have a parent or guardian sign as well? Right. Ah. Uh, well, if I did, I mean, was my mom there then? My mom was in LA by then. I yeah, she was. That's why I ended up going there. So she would have had to sign probably. She would have, she would have yeah. if I needed that. It just seemed by the time I went, I'd been living on my own for almost two years. You know, I, it would right. just, there wasn't a lot of checking with a parent <laughs> going well, on. Well, right. And, and same, but like, I know that they were, they tried to assign me a guardian yeah yeah i think in, my mom so, signed because she was there in california she was there in right because she would have been there so she would have been your guardian by anyways yeah yeah 
and it was all so, and that's the thing it was like they acknowledged it but they acknowledged that it was a formality for yeah. you know the uninformed yeah the people it wasn't that haven't real. you know right exactly if you were 14 like in my sister's my sister's case when she was 14 and recruited into the sea organization the family was told that her guardian was going to be her recruiter who was a guy named uh, jonathan glassford and he ended up right. blowing later and she never saw him again when she was there until she was alone and then when right. she was trafficked up to the international base she was alone there was nobody mm. at that age right. and she wasn't doing any school either yeah school so was i mean we barely did enhancement like honestly you're supposed to do yeah. 12 and a half hours of enhancement a week but that very rarely right. happened and that would be least. your, your your study time when you're learning Scientology. I'm just going to grab a couple questions so we don't get too far behind. Are the cult members subjected to drug testing? Not that I'm aware of. No. Are you aware of that, Dylan? I've never no, heard never. of that. Uh -uh. Yeah, they have the e-meter. They don't need a drug right? test. Yeah, they have their they own have the light e detector. Exactly. Bakes with butter. Scientology is awful, but it seems like it's egalitarian regarding men versus women where jobs and duties are segregated by gender. What is it? Does that mean like equal? Egalitarian um, regarding men versus right. women. Were um, jobs and duties ever segregated by gender? Maybe, maybe I'm going to bakes with butter. I'm going to go with it. It just means the same or kind of equal. What was yeah, your experience? I mean, it was more of echelon. So it was more like MLM rather than um, agendification or anything. It, it was. Even if you were, there was, if you had an exact, like, so Jenny Lindstein is a good example, right? Okay. She, um, is known throughout the interwebs a little bit. She was my senior in CMO after a big sit handling mission. So we'll tie this all together. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and she was my direct senior. So I called her sir and she expected me to call her sir. And yeah. so anybody in a senior position, so any messenger um, doing a duty or running an errand is looked at as like L. Ron Hubbard. So you call yeah. them sir, boy, girl, old, young, it doesn't matter. Yes. Um, and then, so they have this more of that, that echelon system um, rather than, you know, oh, th these jobs aren't good. A girl is expected to do any job in this org yeah. at any time if they're asked no matter what bodies are a consideration that's like right that's your that's right. your meat body is an absolute consideration um but so you but don't bodies are a consideration and gender is a consideration unless you like somebody in that gender <laughs> right unless you're heavy petting and we should yeah. be written up right yeah, yeah. The, the tattletale society <laughs> trumps yeah then suddenly <laughs> it sure. comes into full play but you make a really good point i want to just slow it down a little bit because this is a great point you're saying that it, and it's reminding me you're right there wasn't ever men do this job women do this job in the sea or you are expected to do every job no matter no matter about gender and we were told like it didn't matter we've been men we've been women so there should be right, no hang exactly. about it until someone decides that they're a woman who's attracted to another woman or that they you know maybe they're a woman who more identifies as a man then suddenly in Scientology it's like whoa 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 slow your well, roll you're aberrated or your exactly. PTS to the yeah. middle class or your right um, yes Janet from another planet Jenny was Tom's devout yes that's right mr brown that's right so remember, Mike expect to do any ruler. job assigned trained or not had it or not that's right that's right i feel like that's part of what we had to rattle off maybe it was the code of a sea org member if somebody yeah, can still I, the code of a sea org member you're gonna freak me out <laughs> right that means that means your healing path is um need, need more therapy it'll go through yeah. <laughs> let it go think. let it go right. i still remember i was talking to louis rapetto Mm -hmm. and right, we were right. we're gonna chat again tomorrow by the way everybody oh, but we were cool. talking yeah. about chinese school and all that because you know you drill it drill it drill it and it might have been you and i might have talked about it too you, it's the same thing. yeah yeah but when you're yeah. doing chinese school to repeat so it's mm. like you know affluence attainment what is it that's the one that i remembered but right. you just get it back and there's a couple that i still remember 
but I cannot do the alphabet backwards. My daughter can. Right? And Aaron I, know, can. Exactly. I can't. I'm like, that's weird. That's weird. <laughs> that is, but, my brain does not work that way. You're right. No, mine does <laughs> not either. Definitely not. I'm like Z. Right. Uh, <laughs> Next <laughs> I'd be here all day long. My daughter right, right. rattled it off the other day. That's I was like, awesome. she's she said she could do it. I'm like, really do it now. And she did it. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> you win. <laughs> you win. So I am so sorry because I, I digress there. But that point about uh that difference we were making, I thought was important. And that was a great question. When you signed your second billion year contract, did they let you out of your first <laughs> billion year contract? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think that was up for the powers to be to decide who had domain over me. Um, yeah, they were gonna they were gonna decide. They were gonna decide for right. sure. Scientology is uh, very compartmentalized. Even the higher up you get, your you you your vision is a little bit bigger, but it's purposely obscured in in places that you don't realize until later. Yeah, sure. definitely. This is a question from last time, what we were talking about, but we'll take it. Lorraine's asking, Dylan, are there armed guards at these four count compounds? Oh, so the CST the compounds. Are. Yeah. Not per se. Um, armed with um, IT, yes. Like razor wire, bear fencing, um, and full use of any local authorities. Yeah, they're, they're very armed to the teeth. Uh, but, but were they armed with weapons though? Because didn't you mention early on? Yeah, when the pro yeah. when the property was first purchased and it was still extremely wild out in Trementina, um, yeah. yeah, they did guns were carried, um, patrolia, um, I think. I mean, there's bears up in that area, um, so there's you know those would be what they were they were for self um, you know protection more than and they and they would have been looked if you look at like. Um, Gary Jackson Moorhead, you know, you always tried to have a good um, public relations line with any local people that you had to you know, interact with ever. So yeah. you would safe point that by either initiating that contact or, you know, that that kind of, or have your PR people talk to them, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's actually a really good point. That's why they have such good relationships with law enforcement, because it's one of the first things that Scientology will actually go at. Stacy's asking, wait, you all had to do the alphabet backwards in the cult of Scientology? No. What was no. the reason? No. no, no. It was only for specific training, but there is a children's course. I think they do it on learning how to learn where they learn the alphabet backwards and where Aaron at growing up in Scientology learned it. And I learned it and completely forgot was on something called the key to life course where you do the mm. alphabet backwards and backwards, until you right. can, you don't get to move on to the next thing. Uh, let's see. We grabbed that. Uh, John, John's asking also, was there a Beckett guide to know each Sea Org member's value? I don't know what a Beckett guide is. You have to tell Any us, tell Beckett us in the guide. comments, yeah, John. Not positive. Um, yeah, not, is that, we is that do. meaning like rank and insignia? Is that what he's talking about? Maybe something if, where they know their worth. I mean, in the personnel files, it was really about those tests. And then there would be, you know, the, the life history. There'd be a summary of all of it. Well, but, it depends uh, what, you're be, what was being done with you. So I was part of a few missions to man int. So they would basically send orders down to the local CMO unit. And they would say, we need you know, a personnel mission done for people with these qualifications. And you would go through and fire a mission and do go through the whole org and try to find all the people that are qualified and then put completed staff work up lines and see if you can get approved yeah. under the threat of um, RPF, DPF. <laughs> so it was like, don't fail. It's okay, but find somebody because if you don't, <laughs> you're, right, you're, yeah, you're in big trouble. Mission, when I was being suggested for whatever post that was that I halfway can't remember because it was like that, but uh, maybe it was it was somebody else by then. But you would have been you would have been. It would have been PAC. It was, yeah, it was in PAC. Then it would have been probably see now PAC like the LA area was even worse because they had CMO PAC and then they had CMO IXU, which is the yeah, International which is the Extension Unit. 
org. That's right. International so Extension PAC, Unit, right? Here, and then right. CMO IXU is here. And right. Then CMO and then CMO in, right, is above that, and they're all within like two hours of each other, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. So when at least in Florida, we were like everybody, everything had to go via the Merck, you know, like the Telex, basically computer system. So it was we were detached just enough to where we didn't get that direct um, until Mission showed up, you know, and. And yeah, uh, Tom DeVocht and Jenny DeVocht were um, sent on a mission to take over our uh, messenger org. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Uh, what, um, let's see, hold on, I'm going to grab another question I saw here. Someone was asking, Stacy, do they make second gens do a life history? Absolutely. Everybody. Oh, yeah. You're they not, don't, I don't think you're looked at as any kind of special anything you when you you go to the sea or you're a big bean you're like an adult in a small body yeah so they don't you, care you, about anything yeah it's your parents and family are just a consideration that's drilled into you from the beginning yeah so it doesn't matter if your parents were in scientology or your grandparents were in scientology just matters that you have to do your job denise is asking uh what do they say the key to life is that is a course <laughs> it's a really long course. It's a big course. Or you clear the dictionary. <laughs> yes, basically. <laughs> you go through a book about this thick where you go through all the common common words in the English language and you clear right. every definition of every single one of them and use them in examples to show that you have a conceptual understanding of the English language. <laughs> so that right, way right. you can create orders that are very clear and give them to people who can duplicate them understand them and execute them without alteration. Ultimately, that's how I felt why we were put through that was to just make more robotic Sea Org members, but who could, because education was not a focus in Scientology. So if you're growing up, like I dropped out of high school my after my sophomore year to work for Scientology. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, you get kind of far, you get the basics down at that point, but the key to life program was to, I mean, it really made, it was overkill, but helped to create some pretty very literate individuals when you did it. Yeah. Way it was long. also, it was another level of, um, to hold you to a standard that you could now be knocked down from. It was kind of like when you did your student hat and you were, you were, um, fast flow. Right. Oh, yes. So you could just read something. You wouldn't need to start at checkout. You wouldn't need to be like spot checked and, you know, forced to do demos or you could just yeah. like be, I got it. Total duplication right here. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, but if you showed that you weren't duplicating, you would get in big trouble because you're not, you know, um, what was it? It was, uh, the abilities gained, like we're supposed to like, are supposed to maintain, they're not supposed to fall off. Right. Yeah. So you're supposed to have that duplication and, so yeah, even with key to life, if, you know, afterwards, like if you write something that's like non sequitur, they'll be like, wait, are you key to life? And then you're like, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> crap. That's, so true. that's completely true. Right. You always get held to that. Uh, Stacy's asking right when you clear the standard. dictionary, do you have to use LRH's definitions or the actual definitions? Well, it's, if, you're, <laughs> if you're clearing words in the dictionary, it's in there. Unless it mm. contradicts anything that L. Ron Hubbard said, then there might be a special dictionary of which there were in pretty much every course room I was in with special right. and unique terms. <laughs> Boo's asking, if you get trusted and end up high enough, do you not have to bother about wearing a uniform, et cetera? Seeing tons of Sea Org at Scientology events in normal clothes, even when there's people in outfits. What did I, what did you, did you wear your uniform when you went to events? No, we wore, we, we wore civilian clothes when we went to what? events. We were I think never it depended on what event though. As yeah. Well. If but, you were, if you were a Sea Org recruiter, you might be wearing a nicer Sea Org uniform, right? Right. But otherwise you just wore civilian clothes. Now, Sea Org, it, it, you know, when you're on your job, yeah, you better be in a uniform. We had uniform checks. Part of being at muster is your uniform was checked right. to make sure you didn't have a missing button, that nothing was dirty. Scuffed didn't shoes, look dirty. right. You didn't stink. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get sniffed a lot? 
Well, we wouldn't. And so our day to day in the CMO was, um, we pretty much, the weekends were pretty calm, but like from Monday through to pretty much Thursday, we would stay and sleep at the CMO. We would not go wow. home to secure if, unless we were told to shower. <laughs> Otherwise it was pretty much catch a nap under our desk or in the missionary unit or wherever you could fall asleep for an hour. Um, Monday through otherwise Thursday. pretty much Monday through Thursday, if your stats were like decent, you know, um, otherwise, you know, Friday was the best because it was usually graduation. So you could like, yeah. it was like almost, you had the evening off cause you go to flag graduation and it was, yay. You yeah, know, you're still doing have, psychology, but it you're still like recruiting. Yeah. Well, and, and there yeah. was always things like, you know, an action bureau, which is in certain orgs and ops operations bureau um they don't really stop that just always goes if you want something done you you have action take care of it um so there's always missions being manned there's always situations being handled um so even during those breaks you you pretty much work um yeah and you know even libs like if every other week if your stats were up you got the day off providing you pass csp <laughs> So if you pass, project. yeah, clean ship product to a white glove, um, you were able to take the rest of the day off. Yeah. Um, but you had to CSW by a certain time and you had to, there was all these, yeah, and, and usually there was, permission. right. The, yeah. Completed mm -hmm. staff work. Right. Yeah. So it was just, yeah, it was pretty hectic. Yeah. We didn't see yeah, all the time, but I can't imagine going Monday through Friday. That's, That's the thing. I didn't have too many. Like I was. That's because I tried to stay low, low as I, so that I could go to bed at night and not be up all night. What were there course instructors or just someone in the training room to oversee? Oh, there were, there were course supervisors just like oh, yeah. in a Scientology organization as well. Uh, Dylan, how did you come, how did you come to the decision to leave? Well, <laughs> that was a lot harder. Um, I, it was a, a, a lot of things that happened. Um, but it was pretty much once I realized that policy and everything I had believed and built myself up to, um, be was false. And, you know, I, when I, when I left San Francisco and my dad sent me to Florida, I made the decision on that flight, which was one of the most terrifying things that had happened to me to to date in my life, um, to be the best Sea Org member I could be and what do was the terrifying, best the flight or joining the Sea Org. Just that, well, the idea of like my, my daddy didn't buy a round trip ticket. He bought a one-way ticket to Florida. So there wasn't like a backup plan, you know, there wasn't a, oh, Hey, we're gonna, you know, if this doesn't work out, come on home. <laughs> um, it was, yeah. You know, and he wanted me to go to do the RPF. So it was a little bit different than, um, so at the, t you know, I didn't know what to expect when I got off the plane, you know, yeah. and it was chaos, you know, it was absolute craziness. It was everybody Through running around trying to get stats. And like, it was weird to see from an outside for the first time. Um, and then to be a part of it and normalize it within a matter of months. Yeah. And you're just a part of that chaos and it just makes sense now you know like yeah, nobody walks you around the base and like oh here's where you eat here's you just follow people it's just expected yeah. that you figure it out it's like sink or swim you know they keep throwing you in the deep end and be like swim and you're like yeah. oh. <laughs> if you get warning you get good at it. In. yeah it is right it, it, yeah it, it's i've tried to explain it to even to my kids and i think it's hard for them to understand I think they do. They do now, especially the my oldest, who is the most involved in Scientology. The level of pressure that's on you to perform and do your job. What drew me to the Sea Org initially was the idea that I was a big being, and I was just in a smaller mm. body as as a teen right. at the time. I was probably a preteen when I signed my first Sea Org contract, um, or a tween. Actually, I was a tween. Right. I think I was around right. thirteen or so. And the uh, the expectation that people had of me in the beginning, I found kind of refreshing 
because you get it. I had already had such big responsibilities at home. We were working in the family business that I worked full time from the time I was 12, including on weekends in the family business. That's how they got around mm-hmm. the whole child labor law and all that. Right. So I did, I, I wasn't afraid of a lot of hours of work. I knew that that, and I knew that that what it was in the Sea Org, but they make it sound like it's kind of like in the military that you're going to protect and serve that kind of a thing. I think Absolutely. is what it was. And spirit the corpse. And it was like, you know, you had the, you were basically, committing to secure and and save the only technology that can that can save mankind you yeah. know like they they just push purpose and purpose and you know if you could save every like when it, the planet's clear and when we're all you know it'll be this and that, that was when you're a kid and you're you look at your family and my aunt was a course supervisor and my uncle and they were all in like the Santa Cruz mission and so I would hang out and do TRs and it was fun and everybody like, you know, do all these cool and you, and you got co-audit and, and, right. Yeah. You and you go out and sell bombs, books bombs, and right. Or, yeah. So it was, yeah. you know, that family idea. And, you know, when you go in, it's a lot different. You're, and then you normalize it thinking, well, this is just for now. You know, by the time everybody gets in, informed, we'll all be, you know, and it's, so you just keep waiting for that day. and you keep yourself so distracted and busy with little meaningless work that yeah. days turn into years and yeah there and there's so no to, there's so no totally no avoid work. your question <laughs> yeah. i left because um it was a lot of the, like i there had been a lot of su- uh, suppressed communication between um uh, my wife and i like we were separated and weren't allowed to communicate with each other for about 8 or 9 months and um it really was hard because we that was my first like we were both each other's first love like when so when you fall in love in the sea org like for us it was like a a billion years like we were gonna like it was forever <laughs> like you know what i mean like you really thought that was like the most the positive part of is like you would be together for many lifetimes and um it's a romantic yeah, and, idea it's like twilight <laughs> right and i i've kind right. of you know i think that's part of what a, a relationship is 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 you're there by choice you're there because you want to share time and space with that and and you want to meet them where they're at and you're just there because you like them not for any other reason and um, I, I also wanted to not have to live in a dorm that's why part of why i got married <laughs> right right no, i didn't realize any of that i mean that happened after we lived in the dorms but yeah the 2d birthing was way better for sure <laughs> it was yeah. definitely better um yeah it definitely but it's hard yeah relationships on the sea org um and that was right around the time where they put out and this was one of the wake-up things was they put out an issue where there were no more children allowed in the sea org so yeah, anybody in right you couldn't have a child yeah. And we saw people that got pregnant. We had um, our COs, the commanding officer's communicator um, or assistant, basically, um, was, we had no idea. She kept getting bigger and bigger. And she they f- figured it out when she was eight months pregnant. Because she's not um, allowed to tell anyone. That was my experience right, when I was pregnant. Right. You can't tell anybody you're pregnant. You look obviously pregnant. You can't acknowledge to morning it. sickness. Nobody. And all of us had no clue like zero no, and why would we we we're like oh, well that's weird edith hmm. hope you're okay yeah. you know oh i'm just gaining weight i think i'm eating a lot you know like yeah, yeah. So, and then the next day they were gone no questions asked you couldn't ask where they went they couldn't ask. and it was like the ceo's communicator and our uh treasury secretary so like the head of treasury and just one day we're at our org and the next day we're in it muster and nobody was allowed to ask about it yeah like it, it was crazy just not to yeah. talk about it and you just don't you learn not to say anything and you just go about your business and it'd be like thank god that wasn't me whatever happened <laughs> like i, I made don't it. know it's what so happened great but... and wonderful because i made it <laughs> right and i've been on the other side like when we had a sit handling mission come into our org they would muster us together and all our time that we we're supposed to be spend doing enhancement we spent writing up overts and withholds until somebody basically got busted um which one of those was me um, and you got put on decks work and made to do cleanup and you know clean bathrooms with toilet brushes and 
you know, under the threat of everything RPF, RPF, RPF. Um, there was, there was the always that thing that was worse, right? Where right. if, because the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, the gulag of the Sea Organization was one of the worst things that could happen to you. So you're constantly being threatened with it. And you look at that and you go, okay, that is so much worse than this thing here that's being demanded of me, even though it's going to suck and I don't want to do it. This is better right. than this. It was non freaking stop. Do you want this? Then do this. <laughs> like constantly. when you knew, like in the Sea Org, it took away your your humanness, your ability to yeah. communicate with other people. You yeah. know, and like Scientology's main one of their main concepts are the ARC and the KRC triangle, which is affinity, reality, yeah. communication, knowledge, responsibility, and control. And yeah. um, it's to to deny community you can't even look at somebody like looking at somebody is originating communication so it's True. weird how like you said you felt like you know this big being or you felt like this you know like a spirit in a body like you're yeah. not your meat body you were, you know that concept was kind of ingrained in us all our lives and then all of a sudden they're they're threatening you can't communicate you're less yeah. than a degraded being and you're lucky that we're keeping you here to rehabilitate you and You're yeah, lucky it was, it was terrifying to prove, your, to prove your worth. Right. Yeah. That, every day the possibility. Was the yeah. Every exactly. week, Thursday to two, this is your opportunity to prove your worth this week and why we should still keep you here. <laughs> well, and that's the we, daily control was the you know, conditions and all that, yeah. you know, and if you get assigned a low enough condition, you know, that's, you know, every week you're thinking about what group do I want to be a part of? What group did I abandon? What group? Did, you know, And it's like, yeah. And you, yeah. and you think of yourself more as the post, not like Dylan. You think of me as this person on this org board that abandoned mankind. Yeah. You know, it's not like your CO. It's like you, you're basically committing these overts against mankind and the betterment of society. Yeah. So, that yeah, was always it's, the it's thing too. A, yeah. That's such a great point, Dylan. I forgot about that. <laughs> you're yeah, not just letting down your senior. You're letting down mankind. Now, everybody you care about outside of the C organization are not going to make it because you didn't meet some target by Thursday at 2 o'clock. Yeah, everything. Every mission, every everything, every post you are. That's why like, you have to make it go right. That is yeah. the way. Or else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like so right there's the estimation Thank of effort so is right exactly what it's was it the crazy. estimation of effort is what oh yeah equal i can't remember i'm glad i'm glad that i can't remember some of this stuff and i've read i've redefined it into actual societal terms that have real meaning and not yeah fake sea org so yeah it's i used to be very proud of everything i remembered and i'm like wow you know, the more that that I translate that to real, it it's part of our healing journey. You know, it's part of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our unique there person was, undergoing crisis is part of what. Yeah. It there was a question earlier. Someone was asking. Um, I thought that I saved it, but it was along the lines of: Were there any moments of basically when you know when you were when you were happy or found some joy and. And had a good time because I know I had a few of those mostly when I was in the estates organization because I don't know, we hung out more. There was just more of a mm -hmm. that you were this ragtag crew and I felt more bonded with the people I worked at with there than any other org I went to after that. And I can right. say that I definitely had times where, you know, we had good times. There were times when. Even when I was in the Continental Liaison office on Christmas, we got to go to the movies. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, we do. It so ridiculous. Do you remember? Did you get excited about daylight savings time when you got to put your clocks back and you got an extra hour? <laughs> hour of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you were if sleeping. You had... and then... <laughs> Otherwise. It always it would that. be like on a Sunday. So it was during Clean Ship Project, CSP, where you have to clean right. your room to a white glove inspection. But once a year, you got an extra hour, and an hour in the Sea Org is like having a day <laughs> outside of the Sea Org. 
So I remember that being the highlight. I looked forward to that, I think, more than Christmas. Just that extra hour felt like such a gift. And then when you lost it, that really sucked. Because, you know, in the spring, I, you had to spring forward. Right, you had to get just spring forward. I don't ever, I mean, I don't really remember being cognizant of any holidays except for like Sea Org Day, um, yeah. LRH's birthday, Auditor's Day. Other than that, um, that I don't really, I remember it was like, oh, it's Christmas? Like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> you know, or whoa, it's Easter? Or, like that It stuff was just a consideration. As, yeah, as not, a, not, a, not a lot. Not and then like consideration is like anything that goes against basically like command intention. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly. Anything, if you're being reasonable or you have considerations, um, those are basically just looked at as like counter intention. So true. Miss Scorp AZ, thank you. Just got back from Austin being a little squirrel, listening from the beginning. I sent you an email. Hip, hip, hooray. That's awesome. Cool. I look forward to seeing it. Juanita, hey. Welcome and thank you for the super sticker. So um, I was just asking, how many? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's it. Yeah. Uh, how many stories will it take for changes to be made? How much longer before they look? They look at tax exempt status. I have no idea as, as far as what that time looks like. But you tell me what you think about this, Dylan. Mm-hmm. I feel that today. Because we have so many people who've never been in Scientology that are helping, that are getting involved, that are protesting, that are supporting, that those are all the other voices because our government's not going to listen to just one small group of people. But with all these other people saying, hey, I'm voting you out of office, you know, just enough knowledge and all that so that people question and normalize questioning elected officials about mm. Scientology and their tax exempt status. I think having, I we've never had that before and we do now. So I have big hopes that in my lifetime. Yeah. I, I don't know that. I think it's going to be honestly, what takes down Scientology um, isn't going to be this monumental tax exempt. I don't think anybody in the IRS FBI wants to hang their hat on fighting Scientology's religious status and challenging any religions in the world. Um, And I think Scientology's intention when they've dealt with those entities has been to make sure that they know that you will end your career on, on trying to fight them at all. I I feel like what's, what's really going to take them down is going to be, um, pretty much projection, like what they accuse people of financial irregularities, things, things that, you know, corporate, um, I don't know what they call it, but you know, corporate, like not so good stuff (laughs) and those kind of, well, and just hiding money, like the whole IAS, you know, like the way that was sort of started as like a a way to sort of launder money or, you know, those kind of things. So, um, I think, and the way that like, they've already got away with a lot of the stuff that they could have been kind of caught for like doing business as before they were actually incorporated or nonprofit and all this. And that's what they were terrified of. And that's why they went in so deceptively was to, you know, basically say, look, if any of you people, you saw what we just did. If any of you try to defend Scientology or try to go against us, you're that's the end of your career. You're done. Yeah. We'll fight you until you retire and then nobody will do it. So, I think so, it's great to say tax exemption and where's Shelly and all these great watchwords because that keeps, you know, and then as you get more into it, you realize that there's a lot more to it. And, yeah. and it brings know, awareness. First practice. Right. It exactly, brings absolutely. Awareness and, yeah. it, and it brings it to the forefront of our elected officials to get them even thinking about it. They're not thinking about it. They're not just with, in the grand scheme of things, we're such a small group of people, but right. There's a larger group of people that are not down with child trafficking, that are not down with human trafficking. So in my mind, it's really we're fighting Scientology, but we're also fighting all of these human rights abuses across the board. So if we can team up with people who are fighting the same, let's get rid of all of it because it exists in so many different areas. If we can all come together somehow and be like, hey, can we all agree that kids is a bad thing? Right. And it's a necessary step for, for being trauma informed 
is that, you know, we know the trauma and as we start to, um, unravel this and the healing starts to begin and, you know, several different stages start to occur. Um, if we have advocates that can show us and help us see these things and define them in the right way, then that's where that healing, that's where that, you know, cooperation begins. And we can start to be like, Hey, here's what we know in a raw way as we heal. And then as we just start to define it, we have these people here to help say, yeah, this is what this was. This was trafficking, you know, and you normalized it. And it's like, Whoa, you're right. And then that helps our healing journey. So I think I didn't know we were trafficked um, until like recently. (laughs) Right. No. And it's hard to, you know, um, it's, it's hard to, when you have to create somebody in order to heal from what you had happened to you, then that sometimes you also have to let that person go. The person you had to become to heal or save your own life. So when there's more advocates around, you don't have to put yourself in such a polar opposite position to save your, you know, your life or your trauma, you you can actually learn to lean and and trust and, and, you know, not have those anxieties and, and that kind of stuff and insecurities, I think is where a lot of this comes from. Yeah. That's a great point. Rosalind is asking, what do you celebrate with your kids? So what (laughs) holidays do you celebrate now? Um, Well, I really like the idea of Christmas. <laughs> I think that's my favorite holiday is the yeah. lights and all that. So um, my youngest still really likes Christmas. Um, and so it, it it's harder because the meaning is, you know, I seek that meaning more. Um, yeah. But it's hard. It's harder to celebrate as you kind of age and get wiser. Um, it, it's definitely harder to um celebrate these holidays even like halloween or valentine's day it's like let's celebrate you know saint valentine's day massacre um and i get the you know even (laughs) halloween is like and and thanksgiving gets forgotten you know so it's like we got to stay consistent on this on this holiday thing um but i like the idea i like the idea of getting together with like-minded people and sharing time and space i think that's what um you know harvests and and those kind of gatherings um, were initially intended, you know, was to kind of talk to our, our need to uh, cohabitate. So yeah, that's what I like. That's so true. Holidays. That's so true. It is nice to be able to, you know, create your own, do what you want to do. I do. I celebrate mother's day a week later after mother's day with my kids, because when right. my girls started to grow up and become adult and moms, I never wanted them to feel like they had to come to my house and then do this. Like, I just, hey, said, should mm. yeah, <laughs> you should do you want. So we do something the week after we celebrate mm, nice. Thanksgiving the day after Thanksgiving for the same reason. I don't want my kids to, you know, they all have significant others. It's like, it's about us being mm, able to be right. together when we can and do that. So it doesn't have to always be, it's not always about being on that exact day. I do love Christmas because same thing. I love the music. I love that Mariah Carey Christmas album. Mm. I want to start playing it in October. I have to fight it. <laughs> Sometimes right. I just do anyways because I realize I'm the, you know what? Well, Tony's here too, but he's used to hearing. Have you it. ever, have you ever done you. the drummer boy thing? Isn't there a thing like, how long can you go without hearing the little drummer boy? I think it was how a couple of years. Ago. Yeah, because like you know all the holiday stations, and oh. so last year I paid attention, and it was like December fourteenth, and I was like getting out of getting out of the grocery store, and I get in the truck, and I turn, I was like, bum bum bum. I was like, no, <laughs> I was trying to go before <laughs> Christmas without hearing. Um, but yeah, maybe know. that's a fun. There you go. That's a fun game to play this year. It's like, how long can you go without hearing Little Drummer Boy on the radio? <laughs> I'll have to remember that. I'll have to remember that. I love how like chill and calm you are. You have such a, just like a chill energy about you, Dylan, which I think a lot of people would agree with. And I would just like to say for the record, Dylan here is single and ready to mingle. <laughs> ready to mingle. <laughs> Funny. he lives in colorado. <laughs> yeah, in colorado hey george surrounded by scientology thank you darn just got on i have to go back and watch yes we covered some fun stuff you know see your trauma is always a good one 
<laughs> you forget about right. their it's I don't know about you, but I kind of like comp, like compressed it all into like just different time periods. And I find myself unpacking it depending on the conversation that I'm right. having because there's that I forgot about. And so it's really neat for me to be able to talk to people, other people who've been in the Sea Org as well, and kind of compare notes, not just what happened then, but to like how you are now and what we're doing now. And that's part of why I wanted to name my channel Scientology Life After a Cult, because I also wanted to be able to talk about that. Because to me, that is the importance of it. And why I want to do this is to show, because when you leave the sea organization, you're told you are a degraded being and you will always right. be a degraded being. You are not allowed to be in any of the magazines for Scientology or any of that stuff if you are an ex sea Org member because you are a degraded being. And to right. show people that that is not true, you know, that, that you can do. And I think, I think about this with anybody who's been through trauma, who's been through those struggles, right? I think that's why mm -hmm. people, this is my opinion, I think watch and follow a lot of our channels is they can make that tie with, hey, that was a really messed up story I just heard. And uh, those two are still stringing sentences together. So maybe I can get through tomorrow, you know, whatever that thing is. And I find it inspiring to hear the stories of other people in Scientology or who went through it. And even those who who were never in Scientology, but just are still overcoming and working through certain things. I just think it's amazing yeah. that we can actually talk about it. That just like it's yeah. crazy. George, thank you. Surrounded by Scientology, you'll find George protesting over there in Clearwater. Plus Dylan played rugby and we need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk, yes. Oh, that Definitely. is so great. <clears throat> Right, well, we yeah. are going to wrap it up, but is there anything you wanted to chat about before we uh, head out? Um, no, I, I think that we kind of covered Sea Org. It's easy to get distracted and off into different areas. Yeah, um, it really is, especially over the fact that Dylan is single and has two beautiful children. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, no, I think that I, I'm, I'm leading up to talking about after leaving the Sea Org um yeah. and stuff i just i gotta figure out a way to embrace that um yeah because it makes it i don't mind being vulnerable but it it it's sort of it's that cliff that i have a hard time climbing myself back up to <laughs> so yeah I, um, I get that and i know it's come up a couple times and so i right. didn't push it i know it's a tough thing to talk about your right. leaving story needs to be its own whole thing you know, and maybe it's something we talk about offline too, just to kind of just yeah. talk it through in terms of how you share certain aspects of that. If you think that that would be helpful, it's not something that you got to start with, you know, just I just don't, I, my, my main concern is, is not, um, trauma dumping. I don't, I mean, I don't mind going on that journey and landing that, that plane. I just, I think it's something that, um, is, is filled with a lot of, um, final thoughts at a lot of yeah. different times. And, um, I think it's something that, you know, then you can like, even to become a person to get yourself out of that, you have to let go of that. Like I've lived a couple lifetimes, you know, and then to, to yeah, heal from all that and become codependent and get into that kind of a relationship willingly thinking you can help somebody because look what you've been through, you know? So it's like, Feeling those layers are a lot harder. And, and I think it, at this point in my journey, I'm, I want to, I want to talk about that with people. Cause I know it's something a lot of people share and I, I really want to embrace what other people have gone through to help me understand a lot of my confusion or a lot of my like blank trauma of where, you know, you think you get to a place and then all of a sudden everything just turns white and blank and you're just like, yeah. I don't know even how to, I don't know what to say. Like, so, yeah. um, I don't know if that makes sense, agree. but <laughs> it makes yeah. total sense. You're, but because I'm, I'm a little, I'm more familiar with your leaving story and what that was like afterwards. And you're right. I think that's something that just to have some dedicated time to so that, and you know, whenever you're ready to share that, cause we're definitely going to do another video and we have a million things to talk about. So whenever you're ready to talk about that, then that'll be when we talk about it. And I think it would be enlightening, eye-opening, eye-opening 
mortifying. But again, it's all about where you are today. Well, it's like, yeah, I mean, I just think that if for me to, I, I don't know that I can do it by myself. Um, but I also want to preface it so people are able to watch it when they feel like they're able to, and not that I'm not trying to center myself in any way. I just, yeah. I don't want to accidentally just be like, yeah. And just go into stuff where, um, you know, people might not be ready for it and then there's nobody there to, to hold space for them. Um, yeah. and so that, that's all is, is, is kind of a concern. So. Well, if we end up doing that, we'll just say ahead of time, we're going to talk right. about Dylan leaving the Sea Org story and what happened afterwards. So get yourself in a good, healthy mindset because you're going right. to need it. And But again, well, there's light at the people, end of the tunnel, but it gets exactly, pretty dark. Through. Exactly. You're, you're here. We're looking at you. You're incredibly just like your point of view on things is so deep. You're so so smart and so calm and when you hear everything that you've been through then like you know it's funny because i say this so much about people in the sea Oregon. it's like i went through my own thing but i don't think of myself as like i'm not calm <laughs> but i am calm right. but i'm not calm it's just it's different and i just think it's a beautiful thing to you're like this diamond you know you got tumbled around and but you came out and it it's it's so much better so when you're ready to share that I would love to be able to talk to you about it, but in your due time, however you feel. No, absolutely. No, and, and that's like I say, I'm I'm down to dive in. I'm just trying to be more, you know, conscious of it and more like when the more you learn about your your personal like every healing journey is like a fingerprint. There's no like one way to do it. Everybody has their own and it all happens in in different ways. It's not just a linear thing like a routing form that you can check off, right? So uh, yeah. I, I think that if we dive into it, it would be irresponsible for me to just, and I don't know that I'm, you know, I'm kind of always ready to re-experience that um, illness because I don't look at it as pain. I look at it as more of an illness of something. Um, but at the same time, it's stuff that I, I know as ex org and, you know, in Scientology, we are taught to just gloss over things. So and be able to be like, oh yeah, quit knocking, you know, knock it off, you blah blah blah, and really invalidate people, but never, you know, don't invalidate me, you know, or evaluate. But um, <laughs> it's very, it's a cruel environment that's that's devoid of compassion and empathy and and any sort of reciprocity. So um, I just try My to Tony stay, says, just stay at that place. Yeah, and but, I love too that your concern is really about everybody else. And how they're going to deal with it and how they're going to feel when they hear that. But I think that's why, you know, we just give a little warning ahead of time. And right, then whoever right. shows up Absolutely. is there to hold that space together. I don't Absolutely. think anyone else. Yeah. yeah. My Tony says, I don't think anyone else is worried about being about being trauma dumped on. Dylan, at your leisure, my friend. This is your journey. We're here to support. And I think I that's a message that. that is just continuing throughout there as well. Acupunk says, Yeah, just have a trigger warning. Hmm. Right. Probably should do it more often. But yeah. So we are going to wrap up and we are going to do this again because we have a million things to talk about <laughs> right. that we can try to get more into as well. So Absolutely. I so appreciate you coming on again. It's just always a pleasure. I always feel like I learned something when we chat. I love it. Oh, thanks. Everybody else Me too. I enjoyed our conversation. I appreciate you as well. Good. Okay, everybody, you know the drill. Hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe. Head over to Dylan's channel, which you can see right here. You guys know him as Blow Drill. Wait, why does that look not right? There we go. That's your channel. Right? Can you see it? There we oh, go. Wow. I'm click on that. Oh, that's stuff on the side. and then like, Yeah, there's all this stuff. Is this where you live? This, this photo is really cool. Yeah, it's in my backyard. That's one of my trees. Oh, you either wow. get places that don't have trees or places that have trees. I got a few. Yeah. They're elms, so they're not amazing. Very cool. Very cool. But you can follow him at Blow Drill. Make sure you hit the notification bell too after you subscribe so you know when he goes on and does videos. And same thing here. Hit the notification bell. Hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much, everybody. Hold tight, Dylan. I'll see you in a second. All right. Everybody else. Enjoy the evening. Get out there and have a cult-free day.